you took the words right out of my mouth. I'm going to try to say this without, and you'll find this out about me. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Um, I want to try to say this without tearing up. This past, this past Sunday, not today, but this past Sunday, I was asked when I interviewed uh, for the position, um, they asked me what my first impressions of the church were. And I told them that it, that it seemed to me from just knowing y'all the two hours that I had seen y'all, that y'all were a church that wanted to be together. Y'all were a church that wanted to strive to do what the gospel of Christ is and what it says and to grow in the community. Then on Wednesday, it was like we had been here for ages. We were treated just like family. And then this morning, the same thing. We were treated like family. That's what we were hoping and praying for. And uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank the elders uh, for giving this 28-year-old an opportunity to work with a congregation that uh, is is a good group of people. And I hope to get to know you, each one of you, and uh, the things that we can do together, I'm looking forward to working with each one of you. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now that we got the emotional stuff out of the way. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We, if, if you know the text, you can probably... Quote it by heart. I have a question to begin. What if you couldn't come to church today or next Sunday until you put into practice what you learned today? Think about that for a second. What if you couldn't come to church? What if you weren't allowed to come into the building until you put into practice what you learned from the previous week. In your professional life, if you don't grow in your professional life, what does the boss do? He calls you into his office, or she calls you into her office, and says, we need to have a talk. You're not, something's not jiving. Something's not taking, something's not taking hold of this. You need to figure this out. In the church, we sometimes have people who don't want to put into practice what they learn. They just come and go through the motions of, well, I'm here. This is is good. But they don't really put into practice. Once they leave those doors, it's like everything they learn leaves well that's not how the gospel is supposed to do notice in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 he says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your reasonable service he's not saying that it's unreasonable to present your bodies as a living sacrifice He's saying it's very reasonable because think about what is going on. It is understood, but think about the fact that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice when Christ made the ultimate sacrifice. We are to live our lives holy and acceptable to God. Christ did everything for us but he paid the ultimate price. So we are to live holy and acceptable to God. And notice in verse 2, 
do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word in, the ver- in verse 2 right there for transformed is metamorpho, which is, which is where we get our English word metamorphosis. That is what we are to do. It, have you ever watched a butterfly, a, a caterpillar turn into a butterfly? It, me, it transforms. There's a, there is a time. What is it called? Well, not uh, um, metamorphosis. Well, anyway, I can't remember the word. It, it's uh, anyway, but anyway. On the note of the caterpillar turning into the butterfly, when we become Christians, there is a transformation that takes place. There is a transformation that should take place for us. And what does it look like? If we were to really hash out what it really truly looks like, we're not talking about something supernatural where cocoon comes on to us and we uh, something happens supernaturally that's not what's supposed to take place it's a change of our heart when we come forward and we say that we repent we're not just saying we will do that and don't change there has to be a change of heart because if your heart doesn't change then your heart's not in the right place and if your heart's not in the right place then you really are not putting your all into changing your life it's a transformation that must take place so how do we transform if we are to really think about this and study this and ask the question how we transform through the gospel of Jesus what is it supposed to look like well for one we must follow God and nothing else If we are to really transform through God, transform through the power of God, then we need to follow God and nothing else. If you look at the book of Exodus and you see what the what the Israelites were doing here in this point in chapter 20, if you want to turn there, They are receiving, well, Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments. And notice the first couple. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water in the earth, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the fourth and the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make the name of the Lord your God in vain. Take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. He is saying, we are to not follow anyone but him. But if you look at the world today, I want to pull out my wallet. Ooh, a $20 bill. We People follow this. The almighty dollar is what it's called. We want to follow this, and this is how you make a name for yourself. This is how you make a life for yourself. Well, God is telling you how to make a life for yourself is to follow me. I'll provide what you need. Don't follow anything else but me. When you go over to Christ's earthly ministry, and you look in his Sermon on the Mount, and he's, he talks about in verses, in, beginning in verse 19 of chapter 6 of Matthew, 
Do not lay up your, for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where, fee, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Skip down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot serve two people. We cannot serve two gods. And that is the point that is being tried, is being made by God through his holy word. Because if you read Acts chapter 2, we, we should know this text by it like the back of our hands. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and following. Men, what shall we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to point something out. Notice he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Two persons of the Godhead are mentioned there, and we know that the word of God is breathed out by God, so we have three persons of the Godhead acting here. We are to follow God. That is what we are to do. So in ver we find that. So how does the Word of God transform us? Well, first off, we need to follow God. That's what we need to do. Secondly, we need to be faithful. There was a church in Revelation that we read of in Revelation chapter 2 that was known as the faithful church. And Christ speaks of it in verses 8 to 11. The church at Smyrna. Speaking of the, it, actually it's chapter 3. I, I apologize, chapter 3. The faithful church. Speaking of the church of Philadelphia, and he says they, the church had been faithful. That they, had, that they had been holding fast to, he tells them to hold fast to what you have. The church at Smyrna, as we see, was being persecuted, and they're, and they're being told, do not fear any of those things, verse 10 of chapter 2, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. And skip down, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. How do we transform? We need to be faithful to God. We need to ha understand that as Christians, we must understand that faith is a virtue. Faith should be one of the key components of our life. And we must also realize that when we are being faithful, that we aren't just saying it out of the corner of our mouth. Because then people are going to look at us and say we're hypocrites. They need to see what you profess on Sunday is what you profess throughout the entire week. I know it is difficult to walk the Christian life, walk the Christian road. It is difficult. But to be transformed by the power of God, be transformed into a congregation and transformed into a people who are lovingly willing to be persecuted by people who do not like the gospel of Christ. We must be faithful. Because there will be times where people will come up against the gospel, come up against you personally, have personal attacks made against you. Well, you're just one of those fanatics. You're just one of those people who, does, who says, you know, 
you, you believe in something that isn't real. Please tell me how God is real. And they'll come up against you. If you're faithful, if you are faithful, and you are studying the scripture daily, you will have an answer to that question. You will have an answer to any question that comes up against you when it comes to the gospel of Christ. Paul had faith to go to Damascus. After being met on the road by the Lord, he had faith to go to Damascus. He was told, go into the city and you will be told what to do. And it took three days. Now, in those three days, he prayed, fasted, and he was just waiting. But he had faith that the Lord would do what he said. And at the end of those three days, the scales were, the scales were removed when Ananias came to him and said, You are going to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Noah had faith that the boat that he was going to build was going to actually do what God said it would do, which is save his family. Save eight people and the animals going two by two. I've been to the Ark Encounter up in Williamsburg, Kentucky. It is amazing. It is truly astonishing and I will tell you that if that is just a glimpse of what Noah actually did oh my goodness it took a lot of people to build the ark that's up there it took one guy and his sons to build the ark that actually did the deed and Noah had faith that he, would be, that he and his family would be saved by the flood. We must know that faith is the love that we feel about God transforming our lives from the horrible state we were in into the wonderful state that we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus has given us this wonderful opportunity through his death, burial, and resurrection. And too many times, we see it all too often, people take it for granted. We take our Christianity for granted. Because, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. That doesn't give you free license to do what you want. You can still fall from grace. Peter fell multiple times. Even when Christ was on this earth, he fell. And he got back up. Because he had faith that God would see him through. That Jesus would see him through. But we have to have that faith. And when God is in our lives, we are transformed by our faith. But thirdly, let the word of God speak to us. Now, you might be wondering, what do I mean by let the Word of God speak to us? I don't mean better felt than told, still sm uh, a still soft voice. I'm talking about that in 2 Timothy, Paul would say, all scripture is breathed out, spoken by God, and is profitable for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when we have that, when we understand this, we then can fully understand what it means to let the word of God speak to us. In Colossians chapter 3, we read, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We read in Hebrews chapter 4 of the word of God being living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through to the divisions of man, even to the marrow of man, to the very essence of your being, the word of God will pierce your soul. What happened on the day of Pentecost? They were pricked in their hearts. It doesn't mean their physical heart. It means their spiritual heart. They were pricked to their spiritual heart because the word of God was spoken in its simplicity but in its power. That is, that is the true nature of the gospel of Christ is power. Power. Transformation and power. And when you think about this, when you talk about this, it gives us, it should give us some stillness in our souls, understanding that God did not do everything he did by happenstance. He did it for a reason. He gave us the words that we have for a reason. And are we going to let them transform us? Or are we going to sit idly by and not do anything with it? Paul tells the young preacher to rightly handle or rightly divide the word of truth. Well, we have to rightly handle the word of truth. If you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3 and this will be our final passage that we will look at this uh, this evening I want to begin in verse 3 knowing this and knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition. But of God, ungodly men... But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is long-suffering with us. We make mistakes on a daily basis. But, and we sometimes are, we sometimes get in our own way. Sadly, that is the case. We get in our own way. But yet, the Lord still loves us. The Lord still is there for us. To help you understand the transformation that can take place. Year, several years ago, I was, when I was in college, there was a picture that was circulating around. And it was a painting that was made. Um, I don't know who the author of the painting was. I just know what it looked like. It was a black background, and it was a door. On one side was a person, random person. On the other side was the artist's depiction of Christ. And it showed the door. 
and you could tell that there was a doorknob. But guess where the doorknob was? It was on the guy's side, not on Christ's side. Because it doesn't matter at the end of the day all the words that Christ spoke during his earthly ministry, all the words that are put in this Bible, it still takes us opening our hearts to that, to be transformed by the Word of God. It still takes us opening our, heart, opening our hearts. And that picture, the, the, it was before memes were a thing, if you know what a meme is, it's words on a picture. Well, it was before memes were a thing, and the words on the picture are, Christ is knocking, are you going to answer? And it's showing Christ doing this. He's knocking, are you going to open the door? Are you going to let him transform your life? A lot of us can say, most of us can say that God transformed our lives. I tell Sarah all the time. Second greatest day of my life was Lance being born. Third greatest day of my life was us being married. First greatest day was when I was baptized. Now, the second greatest day used to be our marriage. But when Lance was born, that kind of fell down because Lance, because if you if you don't have a kid and you if you have a kid, I should say, if you have a kid, you know that once that child is born, it's it's different. It it transforms your life. But the first greatest day of my life was when I put Christ on in baptism. Because that transformed my, not only my physical life, it transformed my spiritual life. Now, another great day of my life was when I was restored just before I went off to college. Because I needed to come back to God. Yes, a preacher's kid even sometimes needs to be restored. But I will tell you it was a great day. Because I transform my life to the better. This evening it might be that you are seeking to rededicate your life to Christ as a Christian. That you were transformed at one time, but you have conformed to the world. And you are ready to put Christ back as number one. He can't be number two. He can't be number three. He has to be number one. If you're ready to put Christ in his number one in your life, you can come forward asking for prayer. We will pray for you and we will pray with you. It might be this evening that you are not a Christian. And we can all tell you, as I've mentioned, that it is a great day when you put Christ on in baptism because that day is when you, ha you go from having hope to having assurance. You have assurance of heaven. 